It's, it's really an honor to have with us today Virute Siplijauskaite. She is a person that I think all of us who study Spanish literature know. It's a household name, a difficult name, but it's <laughs> known by all of us. Um, no matter what uh, our area of research, if, uh, if we study Spanish literature in relation to Europe or Western, uh, uh, to any Western world, we are bound to come up with a book or a, an article by, written by Professor Sipriyanskaite. And um, I have to say, I told her yesterday that somehow, I don't know if, uh, I think it's because she's written so much that just about every, every aspect of literature that I have been interested in during my career I was hoping she had not touched it because, <laughs> but I would go and say, oh, she wrote about it. And then what I did was really work on it and then um, uh, it became a sort of a, uh, a kind of um, dialogue with the work of art and also with, uh, indirectly with Professor Sipli Jauskaite because she had already looked at it and um, she had already given us some insight into that work of art. And um, I just want to mention that she's written very, very extensively. I have a list of books. I'm going to read some of them. So to give you an idea, La Soledad y la Poesía Española Contemporánea, El Poeta y la Poesía, Del Romanticismo a la Poesía Social, Baroja, Un Estilo, Deber de Plenitud, La Poesía de Jorge Guillén, Los Noventa y Ochistas y la Historia, este es un libro sobre la novela histórica, La Mujer Insatisfecha, La Novela Femenina Contemporánea, uh, De Signos y Significaciones, Juegos con las Vanguardias, Los Poetas del 27, y un libro sobre Carmen Martín Gaite. Luego tiene, no sé, como seis o siete ediciones, uh, six or seven editions, seven trans books of translations, hundreds of articles, and... Um, Anyway, I think uh, most of our grad students have read you um, for their papers, and they're very happy to see you here. And uh, please help me welcome Professor Sipli Jaskaito. I first want to thank Professor Ria for the undeserved introduction oh, and for on. inviting me and to just, as I told her, I told some of my friends, that uh, for me this is a very special occasion because I'm sure that this is the last time that I talk, and mainly because it is this year that it is 50 years since I received my PG at Bryn Mawr. So from where I came, came I come back. <laughs> and after that, we put three crosses and close the doors. <laughs> Come on, uh, don't be like that. Uh, I also want to warn you that since we are now in kind of uh, postmodernist times still, uh, my presentation will be kind of postmodernist. And as you know, postmodernists stress that there is nothing clear and nothing sure, and everything comes in pieces and fragments. So that is what you will get. And, and please, uh, if there is something that you think is wrong, let me know. Um, I don't want to present a, a finished lecture, which I don't have really, but I was reading lately several novels. Some of them call themselves historical novels, others don't. And so to simply throw out a few questions. What is a historical novel and how we decide whether it is? And I think we have to consider several aspects with what epoch it deals. I mean, if it goes several centuries back, I think we're entitled to say yes. That, but all much more important for me, I think, is with what scope the, other, the author writes. I mean, does he want to present what he presents as historical, or does he want to present it as still kind of contemporary? Uh, is it necessary, really, to put in historical characters, to include historical characters? And is it necessary to give those characters the main part 
or is it enough, and I'll go back to it later on a little bit, just a secondary or role to give a little background to make the reader believe, yeah, yeah that's really several centuries ago. Uh, also, the focus, I think that is where, at least I notice in what I've read, a, a great difference. Uh, authors who wrote historical novels in the 19th century, maybe, uh, they went back to the great figures and they created the atmosphere around the great figures. The great figures very often were uh, kind of heroes and everybody knew about them. Uh, today, the tendency, at least in what I've read, and I haven't read everything by no means, is ironic. Uh, it is questioning. It's mainly present an epoch, present certain characters who not only themselves question what history and historical no novel is, but also who question, and that is the meta-historical dimension, how does one write history? There are a number of novels where the author presents a scene and then interrupts the scene and enters and says, well, I so and so think so and so. So that it is a dialogue with the past. It's not only taking, there are now countless books written about the historical novel. And of course, I, I'm not going to, to enumerate them or anything. Uh, but uh, I, I find that rather interesting that there, everybody is now really sure that there is not one way to see history. That there always enters something personal. It is either more positive or more negative, but especially in, and here of course we do have, I mean, I think it just seems ridiculous to have me talk when you have here a, an expert on historical novel in Spain. So <laughs> she, she will have to fill in. Hmm? Uh, but uh, in Spain today, uh, often the authors show that um, it's not right to think that is, there has been one history, that there is one way of looking at a history, that you have to dismount and to uh, put in an ironic approach or a parody even, because then you start questioning what not only history but life is. Uh, this is the most modern and more interesting aspect, to see that there is nothing sure, that uh, everything can be created and worked upon still. Uh, more and more emphasis is also being put not so much on documents. Uh, take uh, historical novels written in the past century you really have a description of the period. You have also very uh, clear descriptions of the places where it is happening. Today, uh, everything is a bit blurred. Again, in order to make us think. I, in my opinion, that is the great achievement of the new authors who write well, not everybody writes well, um, that there is not one history. There is not one possible way of looking at history or writing about history and saying, this is how it was. No, presented in multiple ways and make the reader participate. Uh, I think today's authors want the reader to be much more active than last century's readers. Last century's readers give you uh, uh, a cake already all baked, <laughs> whereas the new ones uh, sometimes take it out of the oven when it's still warm. <laughs> and, and then let us 
see what is happening. Uh, the examining uh, approach is very important. There is also another uh, little detail that I think is important. It's not only talk about facts. It's, you don't need to enumerate facts. You don't need necessarily to present documents. There is also the affective side, the kind of a magical um, side in recognizing and presenting history. But that way, it should come as a revelation. I mean, they want to make any history, even the one that we've learned in school, well, things happen so on such a date. No, there's always something before that date that was already in making, in the making, and then there are all the after effects, and that we should question those after effects. And uh, therefore, it is also not a personal view of history, but a collective. Uh, you probably, I mean, everybody reads novels, and uh, I'm sure that everybody has read several historical, so-called historical novels. We, we find a dialogue of different characters with different opinions. And we never get just one view. Uh, I consider it a, a great gain, because at least it makes me think. Uh, there is always a different perspective. And this permits, again, to put in new questions, like even when they write, even when today's authors write uh, about 19th century or 18th century, or the Middle Ages, go all the way back. Uh, in the last, I would say, at least 10 years, and by now probably even more than that, the feminine point of view comes in, is much more important. And not necessarily to only protest, but again, to amplify, to make us ask ourselves, uh, since I'm a woman, <laughs> what have we as women gained? Uh, do we have a richer experience now when we think about what is happening around us? And, what is, and that does not necessarily have to be what uh, some authors call, and I like that expression, the rabid feminism. It doesn't have to be. It simply has to show that a, a woman inclu uh, even lives history differently and experiences history differently, and reacts differently. So there, there must be always some kind of a dialogue, which, again, leads the reader to more analysis. The reader starts analyzing according to how much we have read, from what country we come, uh, our level of education, and so on. Uh, this includes another aspect which I love. I think that this, uh, the novels, some novels that I've read lately have gained so much uh, in order to show again, that everybody is different, that uh, there is not one way even to speak about history. Uh, there are quite a few authors in different countries who introduce beautifully the use of dialect. And the dialect, again, can be dialect of a cultured person, or it can be a dialect of a rural person who really has not gone to school and sees the reality differently. I mean, we don't have to have university education to say that reality is that way. We must try to feel what people with less education uh, see in the reality and how they express it. Uh, therefore, some of the authors have gone even much farther back uh, and have questioned the myth, the old myth. I mean, what is there of truth in the myth and how can they be transformed? There have been innumerous, wonderful transformations of myth written. Again, women have collaborated there very much because they show that actually the old myths don't present the women always quite as things were. <laughs> so uh, it opens new doors. 
But at the same time, it presents the past not as a linear development, but as a fractured past. A line up of separate images uh, with big gaps in between, which the author, uh, the reader, has to fill in. Uh, I really myself believe that uh, we have gained that that we can collaborate more in reading the new novels uh, and still learn quite a bit, actually more because we, we don't uh, get the, the ready picture. There is a great tendency in the, of course I've read probably a little bit more um, Spanish novels than others, but I've, I've, I'm trying to keep up a little bit, also in other languages. The hero is not a hero, necessarily. Uh, there is a, a debunking of the hero. Uh, showing that sometimes he doesn't deserve to be distinguished. And there, uh, this brings, of course, also a disillusionment, which I will not go into details, but uh, when you think about what has been written, for instance, about uh, Spanish Civil War, but already after Franco's death, uh, uh, then you really don't know which is which, uh, which was right, and that all the destruction sometimes has been greater than what has been gained. Uh, so it is kind of asking us to contribute something positive. The modernization of myths, of the old myths, of course. And in those, uh, I have come across more of the women's uh, figures being transformed in, in different languages, like the Melusina or Penelope, I think in practically every literature there is something, or Ariadna, or Antigone, uh, and I could uh, go uh, enumerating more and more. There are, at the same time, more some more precise, more uh, his chronologically precise aspects or maybe I just put my hands on those uh, books. Like the Holocaust, the treatment of the Holocaust is very different uh, from authors who write in Italy, in Germany, in, in Spain less maybe because they have enough to deal with Franco. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's, you know, you can't <laughs> go into everything. But to show that you, before you start talking about history, you really should try to understand history. Which I don't know, when I used to read as a child a, a historical novel, I uh, wasn't, didn't feel that invitation so much. E even, even novels that... Uh, have been read by everybody and that everybody admired, and uh, I'll just put my, my own um, case. Uh, ever since I was eight years old, I've been rereading War and Peace. And I mean, it seemed during many years that I knew uh, what kind of a world it was. And so in the last 10 years, when I go back, I, I reread it every two years. Uh, when I go back, I discover so much new. And I suddenly realized that huh, Tolstoy, mm -hmm. feminist, he certainly was not. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, other little details. So that is keeping the history alive. And I think that is the task of a good novelist. Uh, history he must know. But what I mo made me object to uh, when I, especially the last time when I was reading War and Peace, must have been now two and a half years, I'm, I'm just beginning again. So, is, uh, I don't know how many of you have read War and Peace attentively, and you know how he, I mean, I, I, I just love all of Tolstoy and all, the, all of, of, of War and Peace, but little by little, for instance, when he uh, presents the battle scenes and so on and so on, then suddenly you get a few pages 
we are told so where the narrator is commenting and explaining and saying, well, and Kutuzov really wasn't quite understood. And, I mean, the author shouldn't be allowed to do that. If the author wants to make you feel the history, the, the author should not dictate to you how the history really was. And some theoreticians have pointed that out, that today, even when you, when you write history, historiography, you are still allowed to put in passion. Because that way, you will also make the reader feel uh, much better how things happen. Uh, I think for that same reason, in historical novels, you don't necessarily need to do everything in the, in the third person. There are quite a few who write what one could call historical novel uh, with a first person narration. So, uh, and, and the most interesting ones are, of course, those who already create a fictional author who is commenting about what is happening. But then the real author comes in and comments the fictional author. So, I mean, you have uh, various layers. Uh, to me, it also helps very much. And as, a, as an example, I want to give something that I don't think we can call a historical novel, but uh, a novel that has been, uh, it seems to me, uh, not a, maybe not a bestseller, maybe even a bestseller, but uh, has received very, very good evaluations. And that is um, uh, Lavinia. Lavinia by Ursula Le Guin. I don't know whether anybody has read. If you haven't, I do recommend. Because what she does, and I think especially, I'll, I'll tell you why I think. Uh, she is commenting, she is creating in first person narration a character, a very secondary character from the Aeneid. But uh, she goes back in three layers because she presents how Lavinia is talking to Virgil, but then goes back to how Virgil saw the history of, of what was happening to, to Aeneas and so on. So that when, you, when you go through three layers, uh, you realize that it wasn't so simple, it wasn't so easy, and you don't know what really it was. But it makes it very interesting, at least to me, I think. Um, that is why some of those, I, of course, again, I'm, I'm coming back to, to the meta-historical uh, aspect now. Uh, more and more authors are commenting, or at least we get to, to see and read and hear more how they are commenting what history is and what historical writing is uh, and how uh, what you should avoid, for instance, uh, Margaret Drabble, I mean, very, very good uh, novelist, she says, the past is dry and my, may never flower for us. It is not a question of memory, and it is not a question of effort. It is a question of good faith. Only for the pure of heart, the past will revive. So you see, he, he, if you accept what Margaret Bravel says, you justify yourselves. You, you just say, well, I, I read as I read, and maybe it was that way. Hmm? Uh, leave the doors open. Don't close the doors. But have put in some, some feeling. More and more uh, authors that I've read, when they talk about how write, uh, they write historical novel or even how they write history, they say, that you should not ban from writing a personal note, or they say even a passionate note, because you will see things better if you go to them with passion. <coughs> uh, and I, in a way, approve. Uh, you have to purify the passion a little bit, maybe. Uh, but I had a, a wonderful professor who taught me more than anyone else, probably, 
who always said, already when I had got my degree and was trying to write, he always said, if you can't feel passion for what you want to write about, don't even touch it. It will be junk. <laughs> so you have to put yourself in. But that, with that same passion, you go into history, too. I mean, everything can be looked at and questioned uh, with passion. I think it is also interesting to see, to read some theory. Uh, I'm not going to recommend you much because here you have an expert. But, uh, but some, uh, I liked, uh, for instance, one, one book that I read, don't remember when, it's, it's not a very, not a totally recent book, but not very old either. Uh, the author is Wegener about, uh, I, I haven't read him before, and it's called Erzählte Geschichte, Narrated History. And he compares three different layers of history writing. One is Fielding, which is very classical. Then he goes to Fontane, Fontane Schach von Wurtenhoff. And then he, he goes into, <coughs> excuse me, into Döblin. Döblin, who has written that big trilogy, Wallenstein, and shows how within the difference of not that many years, the doors open up more and more. That there is not a dictation to what it really was, but questioning, questioning and saying, well, let's see really what we can find there. Uh, there is another uh, German theoretician, and not necessarily only on historical novel, but on the novel in general, Martin Walser. Uh, he says that the effect of a good, good novel consists in creating a world of experience, or of continuing experience, not of finished experience. And what he, I don't know how many of you know, know German, but I like the expression that he uses. When you write, you have to present the facts, but not in a too straight a structure. He says you have to locker lassen, to leave them a bit adrift, so that they can be juggled. And then which fits in here, and another fits in there, and if you reread the novel, then of course you can change your order so that history should be alive. Uh, that is uh, uh, why I wanted to, to call my, my talk whether a historical novel is a chronicle or whether it is a living experience. Because if it is a living experience, it develops with you it develops also while you are writing, so that there are all kinds of developments, and it will be changing all the time. I'm sure that within 20 years, somebody reading War and Peace will feel <laughs> different from what I do, and will look from different angles. And, and, so, and again, Martin Balser also insists that one should not feel that there is a judgment imposed, that there's only one way to judge historical facts. Because a historical novel, a novel, is, as he says, to continue reading. To continue reading in order to make the meaning possible, make a meaning possible. And, and he has a beautiful way to say that whatever text we read, we read, we should not read a text in order to, again, the German is so sometimes so exact that it's very difficult to translate, not hineinlesen, but herauslesen. I mean, if you, if you want to hineinlesen, it means that the author has put in everything and you have to take what he has put in. If, he, if you want to do herauslesen, it means that the author has lived 
left spaces in between, and you have to fill in. And he himself even names it, he says, the reader has to be a creator too. So that 10 people reading exactly the same text will read that text differently. I, I, I very much like that way, because I really, I sometimes have had long discussions about the same novel <laughs> it was with different colleagues or, or, or friends, and we would just read it and see it very differently. He also says, and there is, of course, most of, I think most of the authors uh, who have written in the last 20 years or 25 years have criticized of trying to put in too much documentation. Because if you put in so much documentation, you take the, the freedom away. You don't permit uh, the reader to see what is behind the words. He, he, again, Walser says, too much research may do only harm. Because it, it just sh should allow the reader to convert the text. And also, I think that's the practical aspect in it. He says, if you want to put in so much documentation, you will probably spend your life reading writing one novel. And uh, that, of course, is loss. Uh, but there are people who have put in, um, and now I want to go back to, a bit farther back, uh, to what was called historical novels, by Dumas. Everybody has read Dumas. Hmm? But Dumas knew how to go about it. He had what the French call maigre, people, slaves who work. For he had uh, graduate students, and in those days we are not called graduate students. But anyway, young people go and, and gather documents. <laughs> and then have one of them especially, who even put those documents together and kind of wrote a draft. But that, that draft, of course, would have never sold well would not have become so popular. Then, when he had already that documentation, which the, the other man had weeded out and wrote, uh, had, had written down, Dumas added intrigue. It make it uh, so that the reader has to follow. And uh, he was very successful. <laughs> he was very successful. And, and, and some, unfortunately, I think it, uh, probably it's more difficult to find just the right point where to stop between documentation and intrigue. Because today, I have read, of course, we, we all have different tastes. But if I take a novel, which I, after 20 pages, feel that this novel is being written for to attract the masses, <laughs> to, for bestseller effect, well, that to me uh, does, yeah, does not count as a historical novel anymore. Uh, because if you want only a, a pleasant, pleasing, uh, intriguing effect, that just doesn't count. I think more interesting, much more interesting as technique today, a new technique, which we did not get in the 19th or 18th century, is um, uh, the technique that some of the authors have taken from, uh, from the cinema, from the movies. To, wrote, to write novels which proceed as a movie, from scene to scene to scene. And in between, the reader has to fill in. You, you are totally visual. I mean, it, it describes visual, and not necessarily completely uh, what you would call a historical novel. I'm, I'm thinking many of the novels, and you know him, Murakami. Hmm? Mm -hmm. It, you really, I, the first time when I read his first book, I said, is that a novel or, or is that a, a, a script for a movie? Yeah, because it just goes that way. But, but he writes well. And it, he creates a picture which you also help jumping from scene to scene. And that way you can, uh, I think, uh, put in more or present a, dif a different, a totally different view. Like uh, some Japanese, uh, again, uh, Kazuko Ishugigi, uh, uh, he 
presents England through the eyes of a butler. And, uh, of course, that's a, that's a new way now. And, and uh, it's enough to make you interested and uh, try to follow him. Uh, the, some of the uh, theoreticians, one of them says that today the meaning of history is always contingent and changeable. There is not one uh, meaning. There, is n there will not be the same effect of a historical novel on uh, every reader and it will be uh, following an evolution. Uh, more and more authors put in a variety of changing perspectives because there is not just one truth. The, the only truth, now this, I, I, I really love that, I, an author whom I really love anyway, um, the Portuguese José Saramago. He has been translated quite a bit. He, I say, he, he, just, he has a, a, a nice book of conversations, dialogue with Ricardo Reis. And he talks a bit about how he writes and why he writes and so on. And uh, uh, we're having this, uh, I'm getting lost now. No, ah. no he says, uh, and I should probably translate from, from Portuguese, the, the re when the reader reads, he does not read a novel. The reader really is reading me. Because he says, we, most of us, write in order to know ourselves better. And when we want to be understood by the reader, we have to be explicit and clear. I, I like that way. You know, of, of saying that at the very uh, heart of it, I am there sitting always. Uh, let's see. That is why also often the authors proceed by point counterpoint. Uh, like one, one of the theoretical books uh, uh, is uh, critical books rather than theory, I would say. It's called Contrasentidos. That, that you present one and then you present the, present the counterpart. And again, the reader. The reader is being made today much more active. You have to collaborate. Otherwise, you won't get enough of the book. Also, subvert the, the truths that have been accepted so far. Uh, Umberto Eco has written quite a bit about that. Mm. And some others also. Uh, let's see what else. Ah, I like uh, another expression of Saramago. He says, what, what do I do? I gather some facts, and then I play with them. He just uses the word, I play with them. I put them like little, little puzzles, and then I um, undo them, and I put another puzzle, and finally something comes out of it. Let's see. Now, what I want to, to insist upon more now is the, what impresses me at least. Uh, and since I'm not teaching anymore, I can't do any harm. <laughs> so I can just <laughs> tell you my, uh, my opinion. Uh, I love the books where uh, you, you feel really the person, uh, how the person lives history. One of the great books for me written in Spain is, is Uraca by Lourdes Ortiz. Uh, because she really, the simple beginning, the first page, what do you do? There is not a setting like, you, you know, like in, in, in Dumas, in, in others. You get the first few pages of description of the scene and of that. And the, how does Uraka start? She says, and now I still can hear the hoofs of the, of the horses. And that indicates that the history is moving. And, and then from those little sounds, she starts putting together. And she, of course, just imagines that she's talking to, to a monk, which, who certainly sees things differently, 
And in the meantime, she also manages to, to, to seduce him. I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> and and it's, it, it's a short novel. It's, a, it, it's just beautiful novel. It's just a beautiful novel. Uh, so that something personal should come in. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to just, you know, widen a little bit uh, my view. I not necessarily say that a historical novel is written about centuries past. I think that a good novel, even a contemporary novel, will be read as a historical novel if it really is good, if it presents a lived experience. And in this, I'd like to mention a um, still writing German author, Ulla Hahn. She is a poet, and, and that is important. Poetic dimension is always important. But she, she presents uh, very different aspects uh, of everyday life, like, like a young girl uh, who comes from a rather uh, poor background, uh, has a few suitors, one is very rich and one another. So uh, her reaction, with this, we do see contemporary society. So that is why I say that within 25 years, maybe, this can already be considered historical, because she has booked the contemporary um, society in which uh, she lives. Uh, and uh, one uh, aspect that I have not uh, mentioned yet, and to which I will come soon. Do I still have time? Do I have time, or should I? I, I think she, I think you have time because I still want to. I, I still want to, to mention some a few things. Hmm? All right. Uh, uh, yeah, you what, have fifteen minutes. What you do with the with the language? You see, it, you must pre present in that language that the people are talking at the time that you are writing. So that it would be really quite alive, and this some authors manage to do with a dialect. And there I, I, I want to mention Andrea Camilleri, who, who, who he does just incredible things. I mean, he really creates a whole atmosphere by presenting not necessarily even that person, he's Sicilian, hmm? in, in, and writes in a very special Sicilian dialect. Uh, not, not, not necessarily how the person talks to others, but his thoughts. And, and suddenly, I mean, when I read some of his pages, I see that whole part of Sicily perfectly, because it is just so alive. Uh, so I think that is creating history. Uh, those authors, um, I think all could come under the uh, denomination that Ulla Han has made. She says that you can extract from everyday life the essence which will remain for history. Because it is how people lived in those days. And that is why there are authors. There's one author whom I've always admired years ago, when I wrote about the historical novel a little bit, um, a French author, uh, Françoise Chandernagor. And she has written about uh, Louis XV. She has written about the 18th century, uh, L'Enfant des Lumières. But then she also, one of her rather recent books still, is about a dying mother who has four daughters. Different social standing, in the meantime, they married into and so, and live in, in different parts, but come by turn all the time to visit that mother. And each one, while she's sitting by the mother, is thinking of what is going where she is, and, and with her family, and so on. So that we, and one comes from Australia. <laughs> So that we do get again a historical picture of how people live, but all united only by the fact that the mother is dying and they must be there. Uh, 
it's, 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 it's very, very alive. Uh, I shouldn't mention probably more of them because yeah, so we do also get uh, very effectively you very effective use of stream of consciousness technique. Uh, sometimes you just have uh, one person sitting and thinking and, and already see the whole world, the whole world uh, remembering scenes of the past and seeing that at present and imagining what might happen. Open endings and no judgment. That's very important. Because before histor history was always judged, usually in historical novels, you already got an evaluation. Um, again, go back to Martin Walser, uh, whom I mentioned before, to, to sh stress that there is no fixed one way. Uh, he says that if we realize that it was not necessarily quite like that, if, if the author leaves open door to imagination, then the reader becomes also a creator, not only a reader. You have to create while you read. And I, I like that way, I, I, because I don't write fiction. So <laughs> I think I, when I read those books, I can continue a little bit. Uh, another um, comparison that he makes I like also very much, that today's reader of a novel uh, does not listen to music, but creates music. Uh, you can realize that it's quite, quite a difference. Uh, I don't think I should go into specific uh, novels, because probably not everybody has, but just mention that with the idea of open history, of what the history is, there have been very many politically motivated novels written in very many countries, like, especially want to mention the Arab women, uh, then uh, also uh, the novels of Ismail Kadare about Albany, uh, Giselle Pinot writes about Guadalupe. Uh, I think that uh, also very interesting about the Holocaust and the the consequences, uh, an Italian uh, novelist who came to, to Madison, where I live, uh, just a few months ago to, to talk to us, Clara Sereni. And she puts in very many aspects, also showing that there is not even one way of judging the Holocaust, that it does leave traces, but everybody has lived it differently, and the reader will, of course, also add so much more interpretation if the reader has gone through any kind of similar experience, not necessarily that experience. And uh, that is what uh, I say. Uh, we can, we can. No, I, I, no, no I, I want to, to finish by mentioning one author who, who really impressed me uh, tremendously. Uh, and that has little to do with the Holocaust also, but uh, it's, it's exile, exile is another theme. The, the Nobel Prize winner this year, Hertha Kraus, uh, her la latest novel, I like all her novels, I think her novels are just absolutely wonderful and very exciting, but her latest novel I just read uh, very recently, it's called Atem Schaukel, and oh, and I was going to ask somebody how to translate it, because how do you translate Schaukel into English? Maybe, maybe Charles Is, can... Uh, Schaukel would be like a swing? Swing. I saw swing, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> All right. And if you say Atem Schaukel, I think it defines her way of writing. Because she talks about how she was, how they were put in the concentration stamps. And it was a horrible thing. But she does not describe the horrors. What she does... She wants to achieve the effect through the words and even more through the rhythm. Atem Schaukel, it was so horrible that it just cut your breath. You couldn't breathe anymore. 
So she cannot write by in a totally regular developed sentence. She writes staccato. Here, here, and suddenly nothing, and then some another very strong word and nothing and again. And at least I get that experience so alive that I, I've never read, I think, anything as impressive. So I, I very much, I don't know whether the novel has been translated. This is her last novel. But it, it's just absolutely wonderful. Uh, whatever you read uh, by, by Hepta Miller, you will uh, not regret, I think. Uh, let me, is there anything else I wanted to say? Well, uh, I'll not uh, mention uh, any uh, others, I think, because it's about time, isn't it? Yes. So I, I want to um, finish uh, with an um, with, um, aspect which I have not mentioned and tell you, ask you to write. Please remember that if you write diaries and write good long letters, that helps so much for history. And that is always a living history and not a dead written history. Thank you. Well, we have some time now to ask questions, to comment, to... Um, I have uh, two questions. I think they are not related. At least I cannot see the relationship between them, but uh, I will ask them. The first one is I... I can see the uh, motivation, and, and you touched on this. I, I want you. I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little more on this. You you mentioned that in the 19th century, see the historical novel looks into myth, and I, I can see the historical motivation for it mm -hmm. after see, after after the revolutions, the 1830, the 1848, the, the construction of nationalisms. There is mm -hmm. this need to create a mythical. Uh, history yeah. for the nation yeah. that will create the nations and the nationalisms of nations that do not have mm -hmm. states like mm -hmm. the Serbs, the Basques, etc. Yeah. What I cannot see is an explanation for the the interest in the historical novel in the 20th century at a time that everybody is ideally at least talking about post-national states. In other words, mm -hmm. what is the particular interest in say a, a European Union? of a historical nationalism. Uh, the definition of, of the historical novel given in the 19th century that I know, and, and that is Esteban Calderón's, okay? He said, uh, we write the history of one race, of one creed, and uh, of the historical deed of our men, okay? Now, but that, that clearly doesn't apply to Europe, no, because no. we fought with each other through history. I mean, what do Dutch and Spaniards have in common? Several wars. I mean, uh, what Germans and, and Poles have in common? Several wars. So I, uh, my question for this is, can you elaborate on why, or, or, or do you have a theory on why there is this interest in the 20th century in the age of globalization for the historical novel? Okay? But as I say, the, the historical novel today, I think, really goes more into the contemporary. They don't go, or if they go to myths, they transform the myths completely. To simply show that there is not anything stable. That is my impression. Okay. So, that I, I think about the only thing I can, I can say. It's, it's, it's to leave it open-ended, and to leave if, to every reader, to, to even, to see that whatever political structure you have, it will change. It will not be fixed. And that it's impossible to say that this is really the best. And, and that is, I really don't think that will be, there will be historical novels written defending the European Union. I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. I have a, I had a second question, may I ask it? Yeah, yeah. I, it's something that you touched upon at the end of your lecture, is uh, about the Holocaust. Uh -huh. I mean, in, in literary theory, one of the things that is always mentioned is that repetition mm -hmm. creates automatization. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. people become desensitized about uh. the, 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 the worst atrocities, the Holocaust being mm -hmm. one of them. Mm -hmm. My question is, 
what what is is there a risk actually that say historical novels mm -hmm. dealing with the Holocaust mm -hmm. or other type of atrocities may actually desensitize the reader to these type of events? No, I think only it will desensitize the reader if it's a bad novel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you put in too much meaning and too much didactic intention, then I think it will desensitize. But that's only my, my opinion, not theory. Oh, OK. I was answering you in a way, uh -huh. and, and also you, because it seems to me that the 20th century created a different kind of history. Mm -hmm. We lived it. Yeah. You and I, we really went through a war in a way that the Americans perhaps did not. The Americans sent troops, but they didn't have the war at home or in places mm -hmm. where we experienced that in a different way. And I think it's because we lived it that now there is a need, as it were, to really reinterpret this history from a different point of view because we couldn't really tell what was going on since we were in it. Mm -hmm. And I think the possibility of different interpretations is because we have started challenging even our forms of government, what we were told. Yeah. Now history is no longer believed the way it used to be. I've been seeing some programs on TV about American presidents, and they used to be created as sort of heroes, and now they are demolishing yeah, them, and they are showing them in different ways. So we ourselves feel the need to see what is happening. And when we saw history when we were very young, would we look at history now and see the very same things, or will we see them no. differently because we are older? No. So I think it's this need of a generation that has really been through wars that creates the need for the historical novel. And sometimes it's really more than a, than a novel. Sometimes it's really history itself. Mm -hmm. Well, it is, but uh, I think I can only answer it uh, since uh, I'm really not an expert, but uh, from what you say, I can say that I am Lithuanian. So, you know, I went through Soviet occupation and then, of course, we we fled, but then the glorification of history and the desire to write historical novel that shows that there is something permanent was precisely by people who we suddenly lost our country, we lost the belief in anything stable, and so on. So the writers wanted to create something going back into the Middle Ages to show that there are periods that are stable. But not necessarily, you know, today, I think these no this type of novel was being written still in the big turmoil. But today, uh, the reader would not accept because, uh, for my taste, it's already too much glorification of the past, showing that this was really like that, and it, it, it just not necessarily was. So that... I think that is the, the experience of today. It is uh, Today, uh, remember that we also learn so much more about different countries, about different wars, about different systems, that we cannot believe that there is just something that's very good and something that's very stable, that everything is ready to be dismounted. Also, the, the fact that we are talking about historical novel, and mm -hmm. uh, we talked about uh -huh. that yesterday in terms of, I think she's really, uh, uh, the way you're presenting mm -hmm. it is more like a work of art than, oh, and that's why she said, as long as the novel is well written, yeah. it will not. Oh, but that there, they, I, I totally go, because some historical novels are written more as propaganda also. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, be it for Franco or anti-Franco. But if it is written very well, I will still read it and enjoy it. And it will still make me think. For I think that today is the good, well, not today, the good writers always knew it. But the, the emphasis on the good use of language is very important, very, very important. And I think you do much more through art than through thesis. Yeah, it has to be a work of art. It has to be. You had a question, right? Oh, yeah. Um, it was actually about 
the open, it's a simple question about open endings and, and war and peace. Um, uh -huh. I've only read war and peace once, but uh -huh. um, I'm familiar with the didactic passages. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They're uh -huh. hard to read, um, uh -huh. so I don't, um, I don't understand them, but um, mm -hmm. so. But, no, but, but you see, I think Tolstoy believed that he had to defend, that he had to explain. Tolstoy is not a, not a contemporary writer. I think today uh, an author like Hertha Müller would not, uh, would not write a, a war and peace. Now, I, my question was uh -huh. actually, um, since you were emphasizing the importance of open-endedness uh -huh. and the spaces, um, if you felt that, I mean, Clearly, you must think great *War and Peace* is a great novel if you read it every two years, over and over. Yeah. So, do you do you feel that that detracts from the the power? Is that like the weakness of the novel, or? Well, I think a weakness of the novel. I I think I myself, if I didn't have to read the pages, you know, in in each part, in each volume, there are a few pages saying. Explaining the, that the, the real truth is that Kutuzov was so and so and so. I would rather not have them. I would rather be allowed to, to judge. I mean, if you address a reader who is a little bit intelligent, let, let the reader decide, you know. I, I don't like an opinion, a judgment being imposed. I don't think it helps a novel. So you feel those passages are kind of superfluous? Oh, I myself would prefer not to have them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I mean, when I was uh, 10 and when I was 15, I didn't notice it. But now, uh, in, in my last reading especially, uh, they, they just shake me up. <laughs> but I, I don't tear out the pages, but uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind not having them. So, um, so it can be historical, but if I decide that I don't want it to look at it from that mm -hmm. aspect, I mean, can you elaborate a little bit on well, that? Well, I think it's not, easy, not so easy to elaborate because I really, as I say, I have not uh, done any theoretical thinking or anything about it. But uh, unfortunately, some, some of the authors who write so-called historical novels, uh, especially in this century already, uh, will think that if this uh, novel can be kind of called historical novel, uh, it might be, it might sell better. Mm -hmm. And that again is wrong. So there is a way that you can put in a direction, but you, in my opinion, you have to leave it open, you know. If you show too much, uh, that you are looking for effects to, for selling the book, uh, a halfway intelligent reader will notice and will probably not or recommend that book to another to buy. So you lose. That's the only thing I could say. Um, I think you have established uh, very well that uh, in the 19th century and the tradition where Tolstoy belonged, they were uh, th these novels embodied the grand meta narratives that maintained the heroic image yeah. and the the pretty Eurocentric view of mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you think that it's an irreversible transition towards the subjectivity, the many truths, as you said, and uh, creating alternative histories in plural, and uh, that also came with the possibility of many, many diverse point of view, narrators, uh, uh, time frames differing. I mean, the, the entire structure of the novel has been uh, shifting from a very set, very authorial, very authoritarian mm -hmm. authorial mm -hmm. position to a, mm -hmm. a more uh, the author is dead kind of position. Uh, well, you know, so I could easy. not p predict anything, but it seems to me that now once you have seen reading the really good new novels which show you the fluctuation, uh, I myself am bored with a novel which tells me exactly. So I, I don't know that I would dare to call it irreversible, 
but I would say that uh, it has opened up more ways and it's inviting to consider the reader the, the good novels as an intelligent being more Well, I have to say that um, you have spoken about something I was not expecting. I told some of my grad students that when you title it Chronicle or Living Experience, I said, what do you think she's going to say? I, th I, I said, I think I know. She's going to go for both. Mm -hmm. But no, you have said something totally different and something very, very, very exciting, which is that the living experience is really within us. I see. And that is uh, nothing I had expected. So that's, that's well, very exciting. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Anything else? Any other question? If not, oh, you have a question? Go. There are a lot of mystery stories that ah. are now historical novels. You, I, I did not mention, I had, I had an over there. There's a whole mm. line of mm. them, because no. I am an avid reader of mystery stories. I'm ah. an archaeologist, and so archaeologists <laughs> all read mystery stories. Ah. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it seems to me that that is a wonderful way of doing history because there is a great deal of personal and different characters that are not historical, but then at the end, very often the author will put a list and say, these are real historical people, these are the dates, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is where yeah. I got my information yeah. Yeah. from, yeah. Yeah. but at the same time there is a whole novel built around them. Mm -hmm. And they really capture the imagination and they make the reader mm -hmm. work as you were saying, mm -hmm. that that is an important mm -hmm. element of reading a story. Mm -hmm. So is this something special? Mm -hmm. Because it used to be that mystery stories were not looked upon as literature, mm -hmm. but nowadays they are literature. Well, I, I cannot answer you very well because I, contrary to, to what you do, I don't read mystery stories. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I must say that even the theoreticians have mentioned, and I have, I have read, read in those story, historical novels, which I would not consider mystery stories, elements from mystery stories, if they're well used, of course I think they help. They do help, yes. Uh -huh. Because they uh, help to keep your attention, if it's well done. Yeah. But I, I really could not I would not dare to say that there is a tendency, uh, an outspoken tendency, to, to incorporate more and more and more. But uh, several mm, theoreticians mentioned that too, that the detective story element enters now, even the historical novel, yes, to, to, to create a good novel. It all has to be balanced out. That's the only thing I can say. I have a question, uh -huh. very, very simple, but what would you consider a, an example of a good historical novel, say, from the 19th century in Spain and from the 20th century? Mm -hmm. Well, from the 20th century, for instance, hmm. Uraca, definitely. Oh, for, okay. for me, for me Uraca. Uraca is really just a marvel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 19th century, there are many. I mean, you, you, you look at them differently. I mean, you cannot, I mean, I would not dare to say that uh, Galdos, this and that and that, is not good because it does not have those open endings and so on. He lived in a different time. And, and I think he has produced some very, very living history. That's what I think. Yeah, definitely. Right. Definitely. Mm -hmm. How about the grad students that read, read you and now they don't? <laughs> Any questions from you guys? Do you think that um, a an historical novel can change or reinterpret uh, history in some way? Because mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about a historical novel that was published last year in Spain that uh, tells, uh, it's about the night of the February 23rd, and the coup d'etat mm -hmm. in Spain. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's focused in three characters, the ones that didn't 
ya tienen eh, high when the Guardia Civil came in <laughs> into the parliament. It's about uh, the story is, is told through the eyes of these three men. And well, uh, the author has, has said that, uh, that the, the king didn't, didn't do enough to stop the coup d'etat before the, the 23rd of February. Uh, do you think that a, a historical novel can help to, to reinterpret the past? I wouldn't dare to go that far, maybe. Uh, but I think it helps to make you rethink. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's important. And, and, you know, the important thing is not to try to impose a solution on the, on the reader. Let the reader uh, try to figure out. Just don't, don't, don't dictate. But that, whether it would change history, probably not. Probably not. Okay. If uh, if that's that's all the questions, we can continue. We can have a little wine, some yeah. cheese, and we can continue talking with Professor Sibliyaskaite. Thank you very much. This was great. Thank you. Thank you.